Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's program. My name is Barb Kane. I am the Museum Education Public Programs Coordinator at Munson Williams Proctor Arts Institute in Utica, New York. For those who may be unfamiliar, Munson Williams is a fine arts center dedicated to serving diverse audiences by advancing the appreciation, understanding, and enjoyment of the arts. Today's program is presented in association with the exhibition Celebrating Suffrage, Women Artists from the Collection and the 100 year anniversary of Congress's ratification of women's suffrage, granting women the right to vote. The exhibition is on view through January 3rd, so I invite you to come down and visit. To learn more about the Institute and current and upcoming program offerings, you can visit us at mwpai.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. I hope you will join us for the next virtual presentation on Thursday, October 29th at 6 p.m. when Dr. Clemmy Harris, Chair of Africana Studies at Utica College, will speak on race and reform in the early 20th century and current struggles over the unresolved histories of reconstruction, race, racism, and civil rights. For today's event, Leading Local Ladies, 1848 to 1920, we are joined by Rebecca McLean, Executive Director at the United County History Center, whose presentation will explore the influential people and places in the local women's rights and suffrage movement. After working at the center, for over five years, as the Director of Education and Outreach, Rebecca was recently named as the new Executive Director. Originally from Cuba, New York, she attended Hunter College and received a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a master's degree in anthropology at Louisiana State University. Rebecca is also an adjunct instructor at SUNY, SUNY Polytechnic Institute. We are pleased to present this program in partnership with the United County History Center. Following the presentation, there will be a brief Q&A, so feel free to use the chat function during the lecture for any questions you may have. And at this time, I'll remind you to please make sure that your microphone is muted. And now I will hand this over to Rebecca. Please enjoy the program. So today we are here to talk about leading local ladies. I have, you know, 1848 to 1920. Um, the goal of my presentation here is to pay tribute to the women, both locally and nationally, who have helped um, achieve suffrage. Um, it was a long battle. It didn't happen overnight. Um, keep in mind, you know, that it took over 70 years for the vote to be achieved. Um, and you can imagine every contribution, both big and small, um, you know, help the cause. Um, so today I'm going to try to provide a quick review of the timeline of the national suffrage movement just to get everybody started. Um, and then I'll dive into local events, people and places. Um, but first I was going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, if we, I can get my slide to move forward. There we go. Um, so not only myself, but the History Center as well. Um, so the Oneida County History Center, if you're not familiar with us, we were founded in 1876. So we are close to 150 years old. Um, and so for the past 140 some years, our mission has been to collect, preserve, and promote, promote um, not only the history, but our cultural heritage um, of Oneida County. Um, I do like to mention, because it's kind of a misconception sometimes, we are a 5013C3 nonprofit, and we are entirely supported by the community. Um, so every member, um, every time somebody comes in and drops a few dollars in our donation box or our fundraisers, um, that is how we are able to be open and um, keep moving forward with our mission. Um, and then I would be remiss to not mention our wonderful volunteers. So we do have, um, this is two staff members, but basically our time adds up to two. Um, we're three staff members, equaling the, the amount of time for two staff members. Um, but we are really run by volunteers outside of myself and um, my coworkers. Um, we have 12 to 20 regular volunteers who um, help with everything from running our bookstore to maintaining our collections and archives, answering phones, researchers, um, you name it, they do it. 
And then we also have a wonderful board of trustees and they are also volunteers who are actively involved in the organization. So I um, just wanted to share with everyone uh, that. Um, so we were small but strong. Um, what do we offer? If, again, if you haven't been in, we encourage you to come on down. Um, we have a nice big exhibit gallery focusing on local history. We do have um, a small exhibit on a few local women involved in the suffrage movement right now. We also have a bookstore, which is focused entirely on local history and local authors. Um, we offer a variety of educational programs from in-person and virtual presentations to programs for school groups. Um, so really education for all ages. Um, Pre-pandemic, when we can have a lot of people in the space, we used to be a bit of a community center and we will absolutely return to that but sharing our space um, with several other community organizations such as um, the Mohawk Valley Latino Association or we annually host the NAACP's Black History Month. Um, so we really are a place for the community. Um, and last but not least, we have a research library in the basement of our building. Um, and that really can be and should be your go-to um, for researching local history, whether you're a genealogist, interested in general Oneida County history, um, or if you, you know, want to learn a bit about your house or your town, your village, um, come on in. It is open to the public. And currently, if you want to visit us, we are open through mo Monday through Friday. Um, we are going to have some select evening and weekends hours as well. So you can check our Facebook page or our website um, to try to keep people connected during our, um, yeah, during this strange time. So um, to get into the nitty gritty, this is why we're here. We're talking about equality and suffrage. And so um, I do like to offer kind of formal definitions because I know, um, you know, personally and stuff, it just kind of helps a little bit. So what are we really looking at? What are we talking about? Um, so equality, it's the state of being equal, especially in status, rights, and opportunities. So suffrage is all about um, both the right and the opportunity to vote, of course. Um, and suffrage meaning the right to vote in political elections. Um, I'll touch about, upon this again later. Um, so today we kind of associate suffrage exclusively with women's suffrage. Um, but, you know, in earlier times in other places around the world, um, it, you know, can mean anybody and everybody. So it's not just, have, doesn't just have to do with women. Um, it's really after the 15th Amendment is passed um, that suffrage really becomes associated with women here in the United States. Um, and I have a little fun cartoon in the corner for you, which I really like. Um, this is Susan B. Anthony chasing President uh, Cleveland. Um, and so, you know, he has a local connection here as well. So he lived in Clinton for a time and his sister, lived, Rose Cleveland, lived in Holland Patton for much of her life. Um, but essentially, she is chasing Mr. Cleveland here, um, or not Mr. Cleveland, President Cleveland, excuse me. Um, yeah, he's chasing, or she is chasing him um, because he had published a article in the Ladies Home Journal. She has that kind of tucked under her arm, criticizing the suffrage movement, um, saying it was kind of bad for the household. Um, it was not a good thing. Um, in return, Susan B. Anthony, she publishes a response. It's very sharp and very witty, and she kind of um, mocks him and points to the fact um, that he was not necessarily a faithful husband um, and has an illegitimate child, um, and this was kind of widely published. So this is kind of what that's poking fun at, and that's published in the Minneapolis Journal in 1905. So at 1905, um, the suffrage movement was still kind of pretty slow here locally, um, but it was really gaining speed and momentum across the country, and Susan would have been well known at this point in time. So, just a fun cartoon for you. Um, another little fun fact for you and a definition here, which I will say I did not know this or didn't think about it for a long time until I came here to the History Center. Um, the terminology we should be using, um, we often use the words, or regularly, I think, you know, uh, the word suffragist and suffragette, really they have two different meanings. Um, we should be using the word suffragist here in the United States, which is, you can see from my note here, a U.S. activist working towards women's suffrage and equality. Um, and while the term suffragette um, 
here in the US is kind of considered a derogatory term. Um, so it was the British press who kind of first coined that and uh, the, the jet part being kind of small, diminutive, um, kind of making fun of the British suffragettes. They adopted that term um, and kind of took it over. Um, but here in the US, it's still kind of seen if you were a suffragist and you were called a suffragette, um, you probably would not be pleased. And then over to the right on my screen here, um, this kind of quirky little Valentine. This was found in our Valentine collection. Um, and if you can read it, it says, you look like I am, or, and I bet you are one of those cute little suffragettes. Um, this was a handmade Valentine. So I'm not 100% sure if the individual who made this um, was mocking their Valentine for being a suffragist or if they were just misusing the term. Um, but that's from our collection. And I, even though, even if it's making fun of, I think it's kind of cute, the hand-drawn, um, a little nice glimpse into local history. So first, again, as I mentioned, I'm gonna dive into a quick timeline and review of what's happening nationally with the local suffrage, or not the local, the, yeah, the suffrage movement. Um, so it's really in June of 1948 when the first women's rights Convention takes place in Seneca Falls. This is kind of pointed to as the birth of the women's suffrage movement in the United States. Um, yeah, so um, suffrage becomes part of the resulting declaration, excuse me, declaration of sentiments, which kind of serves as the framework for the local suffrage or the national suffrage movement. Um, so this is the very first women's rights convention that's hosted in the United States. Um, and their goal was to discuss the social, civil, and religious conditions of rights in women. It's hosted at the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel there in Seneca Falls. Um, around 300 men and women attend. So it's not just women, there are certainly men um, and other individuals involved in this crusade. Um, and this is where the Declaration of Sentiments is drafted and of course signed by 68 men, or excuse me, 68 women and 32 men. Um, and kind of the, you know, it's much longer than this, um, but the, the main point we want to take away here is that all men and women are created equal. Um, and so they want to demand equal rights for women, including which at the time is considered a radical idea, the right to vote. Um, and so again, this kind of serves as a guide for women's rights, activism and suffrage here in the United States. Um, and so both locally and nationally, um, the suffrage movement is kind of slow going in the beginning. It takes time um, for people to get used to this radical idea, to think about it, to consider it. Um, and I mentioned this before, it's not until the passage of the 15th Amendment um, in 1870, 1870 after it's ratified um, that women's suffrage really becomes, again, a major issue because the 1870 Amendment um, gives people the vote regardless of race, color, or previous conditions. It doesn't say anything about sex. So it's not until 1878 that the first women's suffrage amendment is in, introduced into the Senate. Um, it kind of sits there for a while and it fails. So there's not enough support um, at this early time period um, to pass anything. Um, then in 1890, kind of an exciting moment in US history, um, Wyoming is admitted to the United States Union um, and coming in, they already give women the right to vote. So they're in, in turn, um, the very first U, uh, US state to grant suffrage. Um, it's not until 1914 um, that we start to see a lot of movement um, in the Senate and the House again. So here, um, another amendment in, introduced, but again, it fails. So in the meantime, keep, or like during this time, keep in mind that people would have been um, marching, writing petitions, um, writing articles, publishing stuff, books, newspapers, speeches. Um, so it's, it's a constant movement and it gains momentum through time. I think we all know we celebrated a few years ago, of course, um, suffrage passes here in New York State in 1917. Um, you can see here, this is the front page, I believe, from, or it's from the Saturday Globe. Actually, I don't know if it made the front page. Um, and my picture on the front here for you, that's Anna Howard, Susan B. Anthony, and Carrie Chapman Catt. 
So we're still going. So even though lots of states are starting to um, adopt suffrage, the United States as a whole has not. Um, and so it's in this last two year period that we see the 19th Amendment going kind of back and forth between the House. So in 1918, or, uh, yeah, the House and the Senate. Um, so in 1918, it passes in the House, but it fails in the Senate just by two votes. Um, the next year, it is added again, 1919. Um, it loses by one vote here. Um, and finally, after some more, finally in May of 1919, the revised 19th Amendment passes in the House. It finally passes in the Senate. Um, but that's not the end of our story. Just because it passes in both the House and the Senate, um, it still needs to be ratified. Um, and I think we need a three-fourths majority, I wanna say. Um, so Wisconsin and Miss Michigan are the very first states to ratify the 19th Amendment. So here in June, 1919, um, but it takes a little bit for others to um, ratify that. So this is a fun map that I kind of really like. This is in June 1919, just after um, it passes in both the House and the Senate and it's ratified. You can kind of take a look at who um, is allowing suffrage. Um, and I thought, also think this is interesting because maybe we don't think about it, um, but are people or women being granted full suffrage? So kind of our, uh, the states that are completely white, they get full suffrage. Um, but others, they do not. So, um, you know, our dotted states, they've only granted presidential suffrage at this time. Um, our states that are completely black um, or brown, just filled in, um, there is no suffrage at this time in those states for women. Um, so kind of a mix. Um, I can't see because of my chat box here, but, um, you know, much of the West is in support. Um, you can kind of see our Midwest, kind of a mixture. Of course, there's New York, but much of the East Coast um, is kind of resisting suffrage um, at this time. So I just think an interesting map to look at. So it is not uh, until a year later in 1920, August of 1920, that we get that three-fourths um, requirement, um, three-fourths of the states ratifying the amendment. So Tennessee is our winner here. Um, Tennessee is the 36th 36, 36 state to ratify the 19th amendment, therefore uh, allowing it to become law. And then a few days later, it's actually uh, adopted a part, as part of the US constitution and made official. So just in case anybody is wondering, that is why Women's Equality Day is often celebrated on August 26th. Um, because that's when the 19th Amendment is officially adopted as part of the U.S. Constitution. I have a fun fact for you there. Um, I also like to mention this just because the 19th Amendment passes um, and it excludes discrimination uh, because of sex. Um, we have to ask ourselves, is there really suffrage for all at this time? Um, so you can kind of see from my bullet points here, um, but it's not until 1924 that Native Americans are considered citizens um, and potentially given the right to vote with the Indian Citizenship Act um, at this time too, even after this passes, it's up to states to determine whether or not Native Americans are allowed to vote. Um, in 1943, we get the Magnus Act um, this is where Ch Chinese Americans are granted the right to become citizens and therefore allowed to vote. Um, the previous Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 had prevented this. Um, 1962, this is uh, New Mexico is the last state to allow Native Americans to vote. Um, so it does take time. And then last but not least, we finally have the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, and this is, was supposed to eliminate um, issues that excluded people from voting, um, such as poll taxes, literacy tests, um, intimidation, stuff like that. Um, I will leave it up to you. I'm not going to make a comment on whether or not any of that still exists, um, but this is, this is what we have historically. So just to quickly mention, I don't think we can talk about leading local ladies unless we talk about some of the major ladies um, in the national movement. Of course, there's Susan B. Anthony. She is probably 
um, one of the most visible and prominent leaders of the women's suffrage movement. Um, she travels around the country delivering speeches, um, fighting for the cause. Um, suffrage isn't her only cause. She's also very involved with the temperance movement, the abolitionist movement. Um, she believes in the labor movement and also equal pay for equal work. You can't see it, but I do have, you know, I can turn my screen. I can't, I can't get to her. I have a signed uh, picture of her on my wall, which I wanted to show you. It's not digitized, but I can't. So she does have some connection. Um, so she's born, of course, in Adams, Massachusetts in 1820. Um, her, her whole life is kind of shaped by her, not kind of, but is shaped by her religious beliefs. She grows up as a Quaker um, and under the Quaker religion, everybody's equal under God. And therefore she believes this translates um, to women, translates to women's rights. So this kind of guides her throughout her life. Um, it is also said that she is heavily influenced by early abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick, Frederick Douglass. Um, so Susan is not at the Seneca Falls Convention. She doesn't really get involved in the uh, leadership of the movement until after she meets Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1851. Um, after this, the women become good friends and again, travel the country together um, and really fight uh, for the vote. Um, I have a coin here, just kind of some more fun facts. This is a Susan B. Anthony dollar. Um, it was first issued in 1979. This time is, this is the first time a woman appears on a coin, which I think is notable. Um, it was in production from 1979 only until 1981 and then again in 1999. Um, she is one of the few women who were ever featured on U.S. currency. Um, of course, Sacagawea is on the gold dollar coin. Um, Pocahontas was on the back of the tw a $20 bill in the 1860s. Martha Washington was on a dollar silver certificate in the 1880s and 90s. And Helen Keller's on the Alabama quarter. Um, the U.S. Treasury did announce in 2015 that they were looking to add a woman to the $10 bill. Um, and I know there was a lot of different women being talked about, um, but I have yet to see more information about that or any women on the $10 bill. So just kind of a few more fun facts for you. Um, again, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, she is an important leader here. Um, as you can see, she's also involved not only in the women's movement, um, but the abolitionist movement. She is at the Seneca Falls uh, Convention in 1848, and she is one of the major authors of the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, of course, she's involved with many other things. Um, she is the National Women's Suffrage Association president for two years from 1890 to 1892. Um, and she was more than just suffrage. So not only was she fighting for the cause, but she was also a historian trying to record the history of the women's suffrage movement. Um, and she also wrote about the influence of religion on suppressing women, uh, which was not well received at the time. Um, I think it's also notable. So she can consider her a central New Yorker. So semi-local, um, she is from Johnstown, New York. And last but not least, for my local leaders, I always like to mention Matilda Jocelyn Gage, um, because historically she hasn't been given as much credit as some of the other leaders. And of course, there are plenty of others that I'm not discussing, um, but she is another local central New York um, from out near Cicero or Fayetteville. Um, she's also involved in the abolitionist movement. Um, she's an author and she's very into Native American rights. Um, so amongst many of her other accomplishments that I have two noted on here, she is the National Women's Suffrage Association president uh, for about a year there in 1875 to 1876. Um, she's a prolific writer. Um, she writes and helps publish the National Citizen in Syracuse, um, often devoting her writing to um, the cause of suffrage. Um, and she, yeah, she is just a prolific writer, uh, constantly writing. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yeah, she's also, she's considered um, a bit more radical compared to our other suffragists. Um, she's just a little bit more aggressive, assertive. Um, and she also believed in religious and civil liberties. So she is not involved in the temperance movement. Um, so she, she's a little bit different than some of our ladies, but uh, still very important. 
So to get into local history, I think it's important to know what we are looking for, not just in the suffrage movement, um, but of course, um, how do we celebrate uh, their efforts today and efforts uh, or efforts in the past and today. Of course, we are talking about equal rights and representation under the law. Um, we also have to think about recognition um, today and in the historical record and of course, respecting their accomplishments. Um, so I will say it is kind of tough to find information, not just about some of the local ladies, but um, some of the other women, they weren't represented as well in, yeah, in the historical record and historical text. Um, this is being corrected, of course, today, um, but that still should be noted. And then my pictures here, just to say, you know, what we've been doing to try to correct um, this lack of representation um, in the history community. Um, I was involved in the Women in the Mohawk Valley History Conference. This was in 2017, and this was 2017 or 2018. I can't remember now. Um, the very first uh, women's history conference in the area focused on specifically on local women. Um, so hopefully we'll have one of those again sometime soon. And then I was not involved in Women Belong in History books, but I believe it de deserves a shout out. Um, it is edited by Jane Spellman. Um, there were numerous local uh, women and men who contributed to um, the vignettes that are in here, but I'd really encourage you to check it out. Um, it's a two series and it just tells about all the accomplishments of a lot of our local ladies. So prior to this book, um, there really wasn't a book about local women for Oneida or Herkimer counties. So kind of a milestone um, for achieving equality in our local history. So I just wanted to give them a shout out. So now I know I titled my talk 1848 to 1900, or excuse me, 1920, um, but I think it is very important to recognize the Native American influence. Um, I know there are certain scholars such as Sally Rose Wagner who've written extensively on the subject, um, but as my background is in anthropology, this kind of jumps out at me um, and was very apparent um, and kind of a no-brainer, so, um, but I, don't think a lot of people think about it. Um, and of course, you know, we have our own indigenous people in the area. Um, so one of the arguments against suffrage um, was that it was kind of the divine right. It's how we are supposed to operate in society. Um, but Native American women um, are not confined by Euro-American ideas and gender norms at this time. They're very different. Many women hold leadership roles, women own property. Um, they're on much more equal footing um, than women, other women living in New York State or the United, State at, United States at this time. So simply by their existence, um, they serve as a great example um, that women's oppression is neither natural or divine. Um, and they absolutely inspired some of the early feminists, um, definitely Matilda, and Doc, Matilda Jocelyn Gage and likely um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mock. So this is from the Library of Congress in 1914. Um, and it's just kind of a commentary on this subject as well. You can't read um, the little quote here, so I'm gonna read it to you. Um, the image here is entitled Savagery to Civilization. Um, it shows Iroquois women looking overlooking a rock. Um, looking at women marching with their suffrage banner here. And the text reads, we, the women of the Iroquois, own the land, the lodge, the children. Ours is the right of adoption of life or death. Ours is right to raise up and depose chiefs. Ours the right of representation at all councils. Ours the right to make and abrogate treaties. Ours the supervision over domestic and foreign policies. Ours, the trusteeship of the tribal property. Our lives are valued again as high as man's. The Indian women, we with whom you pity as drudges reached centuries ago the goal that you are now nearing. So, I mean, I think that last line, we, excuse me, we whom you pity as drudges reached centuries ago the goal that you are now nearing. So, um, you know, for centuries, some, and it's not just the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee, um, but there are Native American cultures and tribes across the nation um, where women um, had many more rights 
than the US citizens that were fighting for suffrage. So locally, we should know that um, the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois um, are our local indigenous population, both past and present. They are the people of the Longhouse. Um, they have consisted of six nations for a few centuries, the Mohawk, the Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora, who joined later in the 1700s, originally coming up from North Carolina. Um, and the Oneida would be our local group. So I, I just want to mention, you know, some of these things kind of specifically for the Haudenosaunee women um, about their life and how um, they were much more equal to men, much more valued in their society at this time and present day. Um, so even in their creation story, their creation story involves Sky Woman. I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Um, but essentially, she gives birth to two twins, um, and they kind of represent and help create both good and evil in the world. Um, many of their oral tales and traditions involve the legend of the three sisters, um, and life is sustained by these women. Um, women are leaders of the clan. They are head of a clan. You belong to your mother's clan. Um, these clan leaders, these female clan leaders, they choose the male clan leaders, and the men are, again, who ones who vote. Um, very strange at this time, so thinking about the entire women's suffrage movement, um, women are not allowed to own property at this time, um, or married women rather, at least, um, but the Haudenosaunee, the Oneida, they are the property owners. Um, of course, men have a few little, you know, they have their personal items, but the children, the house, everything belongs to the women. And then last but not least, unlike our American descent pattern where we look at both sides of our lineage, um, they trace it matrilineal or through the women's side. So um, I think it also is important to note if we're talking about equity in local history, a few notable Oneida women, if you haven't heard of them, there is of course, Polly Cooper. Um, she is used as an, as an example uh, of the courage, generosity and spirit of the Oneidas. Um, she is most well known, I would say for her trip um, to her winter trip to Valley Forge during the American Revolution to help feed George Washington's troops. Um, so she accompanies a crew, um, the missions organized by Shannon Doa. Um, she helps, she goes, helps feed the troops. She teaches um, the soldiers how to cook corn um, and survive on the homeland. So she absolutely contributes. Um, yeah. And then there's two kettles together. Um, I have her Native American name there as well, which I cannot pronounce and I'm not going to try to out of respect. Um, but she aids her husband during the Revolutionary War. She fights alongside him um, at the Battle of Oriskany. So she is by his side for six hours, um, reloading his gun, really enabling him to fight. So she is there, a part of the American Revolution. Afterwards, she also goes around and notifies um, the other Oneida and colonists about the bloodshed that had happened at the Battle of Oriskany, um, kind of informing the crew. So just kind of those are very brief bios um, information about very two important women in our Oneida County history. So that brings us up to 1848, right? Um, if we want to think. Um, so between 1848 and 1900, there really wasn't a ton of major things happening in the women's suffrage movement, at least that we know of. Um, keep in mind with all of this that um, there could be a bias in the historical record or simply what we have available to us. So there could certainly be things buried in the gray literature um, or just even buried amongst newspapers. That's what, um, you know, there's not necessarily books or articles written about some of these events or women. Um, and you're really kind of picking out, trying to pick out the little important pieces um, from a huge mass of information. Um, so there's a very slow start here in Utica um, with the movement and it has its roots in the abolitionist and temperance movements. So as those are starting to rise up, there are also um, women who are, men and women who are involved um, in those movements do um, start to think about women's rights um, and start to, kind of generate the cause. But again, it's pretty quiet. Um, the first major event we have here in Utica is in 1866 when the Equal Rights Convention is held at Mechanics Hall. Um, and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are among the speakers. 
So this is kind of um, one of the first times we have um, women speaking about women's issues here in Utica um, at, a, at a large scale, a large level. Um, I don't have anything else to tell you there. Yeah, okay, I think that's good. So um, I really like this quote to keep us going and to keep in mind, um, but the campaign for suffrage challenged the subservient role of women in society and required both courage and persistence. So as we get closer to when suffrage is granted, um, I think we should keep in mind um, that it was not well received in the beginning, um, that it could be dangerous, that you could be, you know, disagreeing with all of your friends, you could be disagreeing with your family, your friends. Um, and so it took a lot of courage for both men and women to stand up against um, something that was not considered part of the norm at this time. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons it takes so long to, for the movement to grow. Um, people have to get used to the idea. Um, people have to get comfortable with the idea um, before they can accept it. So um, again, these early days are all about education. Um, this quote is from a news clipping in 1894, just before Susan B. Anthony comes to speak in Utica. Um, it kind of describes what's happening, but all over the state, um, the suffrage movement, they are carrying out a campaign of education appearing in every county and lecturing upon the rights of women and kindred topics. Um, so the, the suffrage Susan B. comes um, to Utica on April 19th and 20th. Um, she speaks at the Utica Opera House. This talk is sponsored by the New Century Club, who we will speak about in a minute. Um, yeah, but again, these early days are kind of about educating people about the cause, educating people about the idea, um, and just trying to get them informed and understand. So the New Century Club, um, they are all about education. Um, so I think it's notable to mention them here. Um, so the organization is started in December of 1893. It's organized by Frances Goodall. Um, we don't know a lot about Frances. It's kind of tough to find info about her, but she is the wife of Utica banker John Goodall or Goodell. Um, she serves as the club's first president um, from 1893 to 1898. And she's involved both locally and at the state level um, for women's rights and suffrage. She sure serves as the chairman of state correspondence for the New York State Federation of Women's Clubs. Um, and she gets the idea for the local New Century Club um, on a visit to the New Century Club in Philadelphia. Um, I wanna say it's her sister and sister-in-law who belongs, but she visits um, and then she brings the idea to Utica. And so her goal was starting it and the other women who were involved in the starting of this club um, was to create a stronger voice for women in civic and community affairs. Um, so they're really all about educating um, local women. And I think it's important to know that um, it, the membership consists of both middle class and working women um, who wanted to better themselves, who wanted more education. Um, in my postcard here, you can see the club still stands today, which was their home for many years, although they are not in existence. Um, it's right on Genesee Street across um, from the Fort Schuyler Club. Um, it was I think it's still undergoing renovations. We did tour it, I think in 2017 or 2018, but I haven't really heard any updates about what's happening there. So um, I could give you a long detailed history about the club, but I won't. Um, but they start out in a few other places and then they move to this location on Genesee Street. Um, it's here where they spend most of their years. And so in 1896, they adopt their motto, the union of women for accomplishing high and difficult things and the ladder that raises the climber while it makes the heights accessible. Um, so, you know, this along with their goal, that's what they're all about. Um, so they add an auditorium, um, which where many other people will speak to this building on Genesee Street um, in the 1890s, a 600 seat auditorium. At the time, it's the largest auditorium in the city of Utica. Um, and it's notable that the women raised the funds to build this auditorium on their own. And so this is where they host um, 
lectures, speakers, other community events. And so throughout this club's history, um, they bring in, again, Susan B. Anthony, Julia Ward Howe, Jane Addams, um, and a number of other famous people. Um, and it's just, if you weren't in, or, you know, not every woman involved in the New Century Club was a suffragist, um, but many were, even if quiet, and you see a lot of overlap with another club I'm going to talk about. Um, so they're kind of the educational wing um, of perhaps the suffrage movement, even if not directly involved. So the big club, um, the big mover and shaker in Utica during the suffrage movement is the Utica Political Equality Club. They are founded in 1899 by Mrs. Frances Roberts, or she'd be known, her name's Frances Roberts, but she, she sometimes appears in the literature, of course, by her husband's name, Mrs. Henry Roberts. So just a tip, if you didn't already know that, um, when you're looking for information about women in the past, um, sometimes you have to search for their husband's names. So um, they had one very specific goal um, and which was to achieve suffrage and political equality for women. So you can kind of think of them um, as the, act, the, the local activist group. Um, they are involved in anything and everything you can think of, um, just like political activists involved are today. Um, they raise funds locally and for the cause um, out west and other parts of the United States. They went house to house canvassing. Um, they hosted booths at county fairs and other public events, again, just to share information, spread the news about the cause. Um, they started a number of petitions and they held two um, major parades in Utica, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so we should note here that the club officially disbands in 1918 um, because in New York State, the vote is achieved for the, um, so at the advice of national suffrage leader, Carrie Chapman Catt, um, they reorganize as a civic club or the Civic Club of Utica um, and kind of live on for another, I think 20, 30 years. I think in the forties, they officially disband. Um, so after, after they have achieved suffrage, they kind of changed, changed their cause. Um, and here's a picture, I don't you can kind of see from the Saturday Globe, there's Mrs. Frances Roberts um, at the 1913 parade. So again, they're kind of the ma major movers and shakers um, for about you know, 15, 16 years here in Utica. Um, so even though they're founded in 1899, it's cited in the local literature. It's not until Dr. Ann Howard Shaw visits the city um, that the local movement really becomes inspired and starts to grow momentum. So again, just like the national movement, the local movement took time to expand. Um, and of course you have a lot of little things happening, um, but not a ton of major notable, notable events, but again, at least not in the literature. Um, so one big achievement here is in 1912, um, because of the Utica Political Equality Club, um, they bring the New York State Women's Suffrage Convention to Utica. Um, and this really brings excitement um, and really helps the cause. Um, yeah, I think I had a, a better language for that, but I, <laughs> that's what I'll say. Let's see what I have. Um, yeah, it increased activism in the area um, and it also helped the club grow in size and therefore um, in their reach as well. So I mentioned there were two major parades. Um, one was held in 1913, the second was held in 1914 um, and they're both held along Genesee Street. I think both went essentially from um, Oneida Square, Oneida Circle, um, down Genesee to almost Bag Square. So the first suffrage parade uh, is sometimes noted as not being as large or as successful as the first parade. Um, but according to the news articles, there are still hundreds of people who um, watch the parade. I think the actual parade procession was a little bit smaller. Um, so it was a mixture of local women and national women. Um, so my picture here, again, these are from the Saturday Globe documenting the event. You can kind of see some of the women marching in the parade. 
Um, and they also bring in national leaders. So here's Harriet Mills, who's president of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. So they have support from the national community. Um, I think that's important when thinking about history. I think maybe at least the younger generations um, sometimes think because the internet didn't exist, because cell phones didn't exist, um, that people weren't as connected, people weren't moving around. Um, but a lot of these local women involved, um, you know, they, they were traveling across the country sometimes, going to Washington. Um, they were absolutely connected with national leaders communicating frequently. Um, so I would say just keep that in mind. Um, um, and again, I, I guess I'll mention again, courage. I found um, a quote here from one of our uh, pamphlets on the women's suffrage movement here. Um, but again, it, it took um, a brave person to be involved with this. One woman says, she's there, she says, my husband will divorce me for sure for now. Um, so you're, you're taking their, these women and men were taking a risk by participating um, in such an event. Um, and so while there was support, hundreds of wa who watched and attended, um, it should be noted that there are those who believe, um, who don't believe in the suffrage cause, who, you know, are fervently against it. Um, and so for this first parade, the anti-suffrage movement has there, the local movement, they have their headquarters on Genesee Street as well. They don't get involved in the parade and cause a ruckus. Um, but they do open their doors just so they can be aware and available to those who might uh, disagree with the cause. Um, and this could be the topic of a whole nother talk, so I'm not going to get into anti-suffrage, um, but there are plenty of reasons that both men and women perhaps did not want to be involved. Mm -hmm. So the second suffrage parade in 1940, or excuse me, 1914 was much more successful. Um, over 500 people participated in the actual procession. Um, there were over 40 automobiles. Um, there were two bands playing as well. Um, Lucy Carlisle Watson served as the leader of the parade. She was the grand marshal. Um, and this is her mounted escort here, um, a mixture I think of local and non-local women um, happening. So this, this parade was deemed successful. Um, thousands again turned out to watch spectators. Um, and again, both men and women marched. Um, and so um, it, it is noted that some, some spectators commented that um, the presence of men in the parade may have hurt the cause um, because it should be a woman's, a woman's job, a woman's duty. Um, but again, just differing opinions about kind of what happened. So it's really during these last few, few years that momentum really speeds up um, and there's a lot more activism, um, a lot more publicity and public events happening. Um, yeah, or, yeah, in the area. So if we can continue with our timeline, um, in 1915, Lucy Carlisle Watson, she comes through Utica carrying the suffrage liberty torch. So, you know, you can kind of think just of the Olympic torch, kind of a publicity stunt. Um, it would have come from Buffalo and then continued travel um, throughout the state. And then I think, I believe, on to New Jersey and well. Again, just trying to raise awareness for the cause, um, trying to bring light to the cause, trying to get people to see. Um, so shortly after this, um, suffrage comes up in the state government, um, but it's defeated by popular vote. So again, it kind of takes years and years um, of this back and forth, um, but the, it still continues on. Um, they're still bringing in the local women are still, you know, petitioning, writing letters, um, going door to door. They're also still bringing in national um, leaders and speakers. So in 1917, we have Williams Jennings Bryan and Carrie Chapman Catt coming to speak on the subject. Um, and finally, later that year, we all know um, that suffrage is passed in New York State and women finally have the right to vote. And I apologize, Lucy's name is spelled wrong in my slide. I always want to spell it like the city in Pennsylvania. Um, and so I think it is important to note that just because suffrage is passed um, in New York State, the fight does not end. 
Um, and the fight for equality doesn't end there as well. Um, we have plenty of women who, and men who are involved um, in this movement who continue to fight um, for women's rights years after um, suffrage was achieved. So just quickly, a, not quickly, but you know, just a few notable women for you that were perhaps mentioned throughout that we um, bear recognition. So Lucy Carlyle Watson is probably the most well-known um, both during her time and today as a suffrage leader. Um, this is a great quote from the Herald Dispatch. Um, she says, women's suffrage appealed to my sense of justice. Equal suffrage for men and women is an essential feature of democracy. So that was really in ingrained um, in her life in everything she did. So yes, she is kind of the leader of the movement locally. Um, she serves as the president of the Utica Political Political Equality Club for um, much of its existence. Um, and she is the major organizer, one of the key organizers in those two parades, um, bringing, um, yeah, bringing people um, to the cause, bringing ideas. Um, it should also be noted that she's also very active in the community outside of the suffrage movement as well. Um, I think she still helps start, if she's the right one, let's see. I'm gonna give her the wrong attributes, um, but she's a member, um, she's involved with Grace Church. Um, she is a member of us, the Oneida, at the time of the Oneida Historical Society, um, New Century Club, she's one of the charter members um, and also involved with many other charities in the area as well. Oh yeah, the Central Association for the Blind. I wanna mention that too, she's there. Another notable woman who I haven't mentioned yet is Ida Jane Butcher. Um, she's also one of the major local suffrage leaders from Utica. Um, she is one of the earlier members of the New Century Club and serves as their secretary um, for much of her life. So from 1895 to 1934. She's also involved with women's clubs and women's rights at the national level um, as a member of the member of the New York State's New York State Federation of Women's Clubs. Um, she serves as the vice president of the United County Suffrage Association um, from 1900. I put question mark, I couldn't find out when she stepped down. Um, she's also the secretary of the Utica Political Equality Club. So she's secretary recording the notes, recording the info for um, the major clubs, the major movers um, in Utica at the time. And I also think it's important to know, um, among, she's involved in lots of other things too, um, but she does help co-author a book that the New Century Club puts out called The Outline in the History of Utica. Um, it tells about the history from the very first indigenous people um, through the time, through the late 1800s. Um, so kind of cool. And we, they, we still have that book if anyone ever wanted to read it. Um, and again, she's mentioned with many other uh, yeah, she's involved with many other issues as well. Um, Utica Playgrounds, uh, law enforcement, clean streets, a very active lady. Um, and last but not least, we have Gwendolyn Benz. Um, sometimes she appears as Gwendolyn, um, but I believe that is a misspelling. Um, she is not born in Utica. She is from Olmsteadville, um, but she attends local schools, uh, the Houghton Seminary in Clinton, and then the Utica Conservatory of Music. Um, and she maintains, she's had many family members here. So she lives here for a short period of time and then kind of moves to New York City. But while she is here, um, she is a very active political organizer and she's involved um, with the Political Equality Club and many other clubs. She becomes the first president of the Women's Civic Club, which, um, yeah, was earlier the Political Equality Club. Um, and she's amongst the 100 women who are memorialized on a bronze suffrage tablet in Albany. Um, Lucy Carla Watson is the other local woman on this. Um, and that I believe was added in the 1930s. It was an effort by the League of Women Voters um, to commemorate the anniversary of suffrage. Um, I haven't been able to find if anybody knows out there if that tablet is still there. Um, but nonetheless, um, she's one of the two leaders who is mentioned there. Um, let's see, I think I have another slide on her. 
Um, and she's one of the ones that, yes, she's involved during for helping to achieve suffrage. Um, but post suffrage, she continues her crusade for women's rights. Um, and she's very active both locally and nationally. Um, she's a strong supporter of women labor, women's labor laws, hence my pictures. Um, there does not seem to exist a good picture of her out there. So I just put some working women for you to look at. Um, she is a major a supporter of prohibition and again, fights for that. Um, and you can see she's very for law enforcement, working um, both at the state level and the national level um, in many ways. And she, uh, which along, I guess, with Lucy Carla Watson, which I didn't mention, um, both women are buried in Forest Hill Cemetery. So if you ever wanted to go pay tribute, you could locally. I should mention, or I guess I'm gonna kind of wrap up by mentioning um, that there are probably hundreds of local contributors that I did not talk about. Um, I guess most prominent, I'll just mention really quick, Adelaide Williams White, she's from Rome, who's actively involved. I just tried to focus more on Utica, um, but there's all these other women who perhaps just appear in pictures or just by name um, and we really don't, necessarily have a ton of information available. Um, it could be out there, it's just hidden deep. So if anybody ever comes across information about um, any of these women, uh, please consider donating your information to the History Center because we are always looking to grow um, and we want to make sure that we have um, a representative history, a representative sample. Um, so just because names weren't mentioned in this presentation, um, their contributions shouldn't be discounted. You know, it took decades and hundreds, if not thousands of individuals, um, you know, fighting for suffrage for us to achieve. So with that, I say thank you. Um, I can take any questions at this time. And if you're interested, um, please come visit us.